Um, so uh, I'm James. I'm one of the uh, CT ones, um, and uh, this presentation is in two parts. So the first part is the neuromuscular junction and skeletal muscle contraction, and then the next part then is all about muscle relaxants. Um, I'm hoping it will be somewhat helpful for the trainees doing the primary, uh, probably less so for those post-primary. Um, I have included some true-false questions at the end, but um, I'm not sure how they're going to um, show on this like presentation and the way it's 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 sharing. Uh, Grant, so here's some of the things that I hope to discuss. Uh, so. Um, starting with acetylcholine synthesis, storage, release, and metabolism, um, how signals are transmitted through the neuromuscular junction, um, how skeletal muscle contraction occurs, and uh, then the last bit to appreciate some conditions that affect uh, the neuromuscular junction. So uh, skeletal muscle is innervated by these large diameter myelinated neurons. Uh, a motor unit is defined as a number of muscle fibers that are controlled by one motor neuron. And most muscle fibers are controlled by one neuronal connection, except where finer movement is required, like with the intrinsic laryngeal muscles uh, and the facial muscles. Acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction for striated muscle. Acetylcholine, uh, so it's effectively a product of acetyl coenzyme A and choline. The acetyl CoA uh, comes from the Krebs cycle. Um, it's uh, the Krebs cycle from um, aerobic respiration in the mitochondria. Um, choline is mainly, uh, the source of it is actually mainly in your diet, your red meats, eggs. Um, and a small amount of it is synthesized in the liver, but most of the supply is just from turnover by acetylcholinesterase at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, it's synthesized by the enzyme choline acetyltransferase. It's packaged into vesicles via the hydrogen transporter at the neuromuscular junction, and a vesicle contains about 10 to 12,000 molecules of acetylcholine. Um, and one vesicle alone is not enough to transmit the action potential as the miniature end plate potential needs to be uh, reached. Oh, coding release. Just, oh, yes. a, just a quick bit of history. <clears throat> of course, Krebs cycle is known as a citric acid cycle. Kreb, uh, Dr. Kreb also got a Nobel Prize for coming up with his cycle. There you are. Oh, thank you. Um, acetylcholine release. So the action potential, um, it opens up the N-type voltage-gated calcium channels that allows calcium influx into the uh, terminal neuron. The calcium uh, activates these proteins on the uh, vesicular membrane and the uh, presynaptic membrane. These are known as snare proteins. And when these are activated, it mobilizes the vesicle to make its way to the presynaptic membrane, fuse with it, and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Um, of note, these snare proteins are affected in botulinum toxin, where they inhibit the release, or they inhibit the binding of the vesicle to the presynaptic cleft, and therefore the release of acetylcholine, resulting in a flaccid paralysis. The acetylcholine receptor, so it's a ligand-gated ion channel. It's got five polypeptide subunits. Namely, it's got two alphas, a beta, epsilon, and a delta. Uh, of note, the epsilon is replaced with a, a, a gamma subunit in the fetus, so very similar to your fetal hemoglobin, which is two alpha chains, two gamma chains. Each alpha subunit has a, an acetylcholine binding site. So for every receptor, there should be two acetylcholine molecules bound to it in order for it to open. And the it binds for a very short time, just one to two milliseconds. And when it's open, it allows sodium entry and uh, further depolarization and transmission into the muscle. 
the acetylcholine receptors aren't just limited to the postsynaptic membrane, but they're also there on the presynaptic membrane and they serve as, as feedback. So if there's lots of acetylcholine binding to that, it um, reduces the amount of acetylcholine in the vesicles mobilized and released. Um, it's also, uh, there's also extra junctional acetylcholine receptors and these interestingly have the uh, gamma subunit uh, similar to the fetus. And these are implicated in uh, denervation injuries. So in patients who've had significant trauma or major burns, uh, these receptors get upregulated um, when you're using depolarizing agents such as succinethonium uh, that can cause quite a significant uh, hyperkalemia, um, which sometimes can be fatal. So uh, we need to be careful uh, when if we're going to use sucks in those situations. Deactivation. Acetylcholine gets hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed by acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase has two binding sites as imaged. So you've got the anionic site and the esterotic site. The anionic site binds the quaternary amide group or the choline, and it holds the molecule close to the enzyme to allow the esterotic site to do its job, which effectively cleaves the molecule into choline and acetate. Choline is, is reabsorbed and recycled and acetic acid is released. So in summary, here's a nice little graphic sort of just demonstrating all that I've just talked about. So your action potential goes down the uh, terminal neuron, allows calcium in through your voltage gated uh, calcium channels that binds to the snare proteins, mobilizes your vesicles and your acetylcholine gets released into the synaptic cleft. And then you'll see acetylcholine will bind to the alpha subunit at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And each receptor will get two molecules that will open, allow sodium entry through, and that will depolarize the membrane and transmit the signal. Cool. So the next part now is skeletal muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle is made up of fascicles, uh, and they're surrounded by mitochondria, which provide ATP rich energy for it to do its job. It's composed of actin, which is the thin filament, and myosin, which is the thick filament. And the basic unit of contraction is a sarcomere, as imaged. The sarcomere is bounded by two Z lines that anchor actin. And in the top image, uh, there are the black thin lines. And there's a central M disc that anchors myosin. And myosin is the thicker red filament in the middle. Uh, there are six actin filaments are bound to each myosin. And actin has a troponin and a tri tripomyosin attached to it. Uh, these cover the myosin binding sites. Um, the troponin complex has a troponin C, uh, troponin I, and a troponin T. The C uh, binds calcium, the I binds actin, and the T binds um, the tropomyosin. And when calcium comes into the cell, it binds the troponin C, and effectively it shifts the troponin tropomyosin complex out of the way to expose the myosin binding sites to allow muscle contraction to occur. Excitation, contraction coupling. So um, at the acetylcholine release causes the miniature end plate potential to accumulate. Sodium channels open and the action potential is propagated down the muscle fiber. The action potential goes down into the T-tubules and causes a conformational change in the dihydropyridine receptor. This in turn activates the ryanidine receptor causing calcium release into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There are sort of five steps to the actin-myosin interaction. So step one is the relaxed state. Um, and it's effectively, you have your troponin, your tropomyosin complex, which sit over the myosin binding sites. Um, and you can see that the myosin heads are bound to ADP. The next step occurs when calcium then binds to your troponin C. And as you can see, it sort of shifts your tropomyosin out of the way, exposing the myosin binding sites. Um, uh, 
and you'll see the myosin head will then bind or interact with that myosin uh, binding site. Step three is the power stroke. So once the actin and the myosin bind, ADP and phosphate are released. Uh, the myosin head then in turn rotates and this shortens the muscle fiber. Detachment of the myosin head, uh, the ATP then binds the myosin head. The myosin head releases from actin and it returns to its original position. So muscle relaxation is quite an energy dependent process, um, which is why when you die and you haven't got any more ATP left that rigor mortis kicks in. The last step then is just the myosin head recox. And this is just when occurs when ATP is cleaved into ADP and phosphate. And, and that energy release cocks the head back into position. And then your calcium ATPase or your circuit pumps calcium out of the cytosol into the circ sarcoplasmic reticulum and the terminal cisterns. And here's a summary there, a nice graphical representation of that. So the calcium binding your troponin C, moving your troponin and tropomyosin complex out of the way, exposing the myosin binding sites, the myosin heads attach, and then they um, shorten allowing muscle contraction, and then they relax once ATP binds. Here's just a quick slide, uh, just covering very briefly some of the conditions that affect the neuromuscular junction. Uh, so the first one in the top left is Lambert-Eaton syndrome, which is a rare paraneoplastic syndrome, which can sometimes occur in uh, small cell lung cancers. And you develop these autoantibodies to the N-type voltage gated calcium channels. To the right, uh, Clostridium botulinum and the botulinum toxin, which I discussed earlier, and they interfere with your SNAP um, proteins, which affect osteocholine release, causing a flaccid paralysis. And then at the bottom then is myasthenia gravis, where you develop these autoantibodies to the nicotinic osteocholine receptor. Uh, and then here are some primary uh, true-false questions just to sort of wrap up this part of the session. Um, I don't know how you guys want to do it, if you want to just answer out um, or I can just go through it. So regarding the acetylcholine reception receptor, it is only located in the post-synaptic membrane. True, false? Oh, everyone, well, why don't we just have a shout out for this? Both. Go on, guys, un unmute yourselves oh. and give us an answer. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you the answer. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, false. Nice. Um, B, two molecules are required to stimulate the receptor. True. True. Nice. The acetylcholine receptor allows inward movement of sodium. True. True. Yeah. Allows outward movement of chloride. False. False. Nice. And consists of uh, four subunits. False. False. Nice. Too easy. <laughs> Next one then. Uh, regarding the actin myosin interaction, uh, A, in a relaxed state, myosin heads are unable to bind actin. True. True. Yeah. Troponin T has high affinity for calcium. Both. Both. Yeah. Tropomyosin binds the myosin head. Yes. False. Tropomyosin binds the... Tropomyosin is bound to actin and moves out of the way to allow the myosin head to interact with the myosin binding site. Uh, next part, release of ADP causes the myosin head to power stroke. True. True. Nice. And binding of ADP causes the myosin heads to release from actin. True. Oh, true. Well, ATP. All right. 